as we're getting logged in, if you guys want to put in the chat box um, any questions that you might have about building a rental portfolio or any thoughts you have on is it a good idea, not a good idea, uh, is this something that your clients do or don't do, um, would love your feedback. Um, hopefully, we'll answer all the questions as we go through the presentation, um, but we'll just love your guys' initial thoughts on, first off, is buying a rental property a good idea? I think it is, but I'm biased. Totally. <laughs> you started young. <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, well, let's get started, guys. My name is Joe Massey. I'm with Castle & Cook Mortgage and uh, really excited to be chatting with you guys today. And uh, Jared, thanks so much for, uh, for inviting me to present to the group today. Um, Absolutely. Why don't you kick us off? Who, who are you, Jared? Well, I'm Jared Patterson. I am the sales manager at First Alliance Title. Uh, I've been with them for about four years. I have been in the real estate world for 30 years, crazy. Um, started out as an agent uh, in Pennsylvania and then uh, still licensed, but I don't actively sell anymore, obviously working on the title side, but uh, very, um, have, have uh, been investing in real estate, started at 23 years old. So uh, um, something I know a lot about and Joe and I talk a lot about. And um, so I love working with, um, with agents and helping them put together lists and um, advice on how to, to, to talk to you know, these types of clients. Um, so if you ever need any help um, with your business, let me know. I, I love um, sitting down and just developing a plan and, and helping you grow your business and make you earn some more money. Outstanding. Um, for those of you that have not worked with First Alliance, I've worked with Jared and the team at First Alliance for six, seven years now. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll tell you, they are second to none in the title business. They do a great job. Um, they always take care of my clients. Their, their offices are great. Closings are always really smooth. So just make sure you're reaching out to Jared uh, after the call with anything you need on your listings um, for any title work. All right. Well, let's go ahead and do a screen share. And... Uh, Start um, talking. Barbara about, asked a quick question to you, Joe. Do you work in any with any states besides Colorado? Um, yes, I do. I am licensed in five states: Colorado, uh, Nebraska, Wyoming, New Mexico, and then the oddball Georgia. Um, <laughs> so you know, it's <laughs> that's a long story. Uh, but if you guys need anything here in our in our region, Wyoming, Nebraska, Colorado, New Mexico, would love to help you. Um, if you do have an oddball, you know, something in Georgia, I can help with that too, but it's not a, not a core function of our business. Um, so my name again is Joe Massey with Castle & Cook Mortgage. Really excited uh, for you guys to be joining us today. And what we're going to talk about is how to build a portfolio of 10 rental properties. Um, this is something that I've had a number of clients go through this class and then implement these strategies and has been really, really great for their long-term and sometimes even short-term wealth building. Um, so if you're interested in buying rental properties yourself, I think this will be really useful for you. Um, I also think this is really useful to share with your clients um, because if you've got somebody that has bought a property in the last two, three, four years, they likely have a ton of equity and you might be able to use some of these strategies to show them how they can take some of that equity, buy one or two or maybe even three properties and start multiplying their wealth creation. Um, and it's great for real estate agents because now you've got a client who's buying more properties, helping you do more transactions and uh, building their wealth. So as we go along, stop me with any questions. Uh, if you wanna unmute yourself, uh, I believe you can do that um, and ask questions. You can put notes in the chat box. Um, I think Jared will be watching the chat box for us. I might miss those. Um, so if I, if I happen to miss your question, um, hopefully I'll cover it. But if I don't, uh, unmute yourself and I'll be happy to chat about it. All right. So what are the most common ways to purchase investment properties? Number one, purchase a property with cash. All right. Number two, purchase the property with a new mortgage. This is the way most of us bought our home. Number three, purchase a property with a hard money loan or some sort of short-term financing and then refinance it into permanent financing. Number four, purchase a multi-unit property as a primary residence, live in one unit and then rent out the others. So if you watch any type of late night TV or I guess there's a lot of the stuff on Facebook and TikTok now that there's all sorts of real estate gurus selling uh, online courses and CDs and videotapes and tapes and that stuff has been out there forever. And they'll say, hey, there's 99 ways to buy real estate. There's 110 ways to buy real estate. And, and that is true. 
but by and large, 97% of transactions fall under one of these four types of ways to purchase properties. So this is really what we're going to focus on. And Jared, you see a lot of transactions. Would you say subject to or lease options? Those make up a very, very small percentage of the market, I believe. And would you say 97% or greater of the transactions that you see fall under one of these first four? Yep, 100%. Okay. So we're going to start by talking about how does each scenario work? So number one scenario, let's say we're going to purchase this property with cash. So the purchase price of $100,000. Now, Jared, if I pay cash for a property, do I have any closing costs? Absolutely. Yeah, I do still have some costs, right? I've yeah. got to pay the title closing title fee, insurance. title yeah. insurance. Um, I've got to pay the initial HOA dues, homeowners insurance. Um, so even if I pay cash, walking out of First Alliance title, I might have to spend a little bit of money to purchase that property. So walking out of First Alliance title with the keys, I have invested $101,650 for this property. Now let's say this property needs $5,500 of renovation. After I leave Jared's office with the keys, I'm going to meet my contractor. We're going to spruce up the property, paint carpet, um, you know, clean the windows, whatever we might need to do. Total investment into this property, $107,150. Now let's look at the cash flow statement. All right. So if you guys have ever been to a class with me before, you've seen our investment property spreadsheet. If you haven't seen that, um, you can download it at www.loansbyjoemassey.com and you fill out some basic information and it's going to give you the results that we're looking at here of what does your cash flow look like. So this particular property rents out for $1,000 a month and we have to factor in some vacancy. All right. Now, Jared, do you know what vacancy is in the Denver market right now? It's pretty low, right? Yeah, it's like 2%. Yeah. But is that abnormally low, would you say? I, yes. I mean, uh, normally, I think nationally, the national average is like six to 8%. That's right. Which That's is right. usually what I use. So you're, yeah. you're splitting it down the middle. Yeah. In the last 10 years, vacancy in Denver has been 2% or less, but that is abnormal. So I always like to use a 5% average vacancy. And that is just the time of the year that the property is not occupied. When somebody is moving out, the next person is moving in. There's 15 days that you've got some lag in there. All right. And that is a cost that you've got because nobody is in the property for that period of time. And then you've got expenses like property taxes, homeowners insurance, property management. This is a big one. Um, I'm a big advocate for having a property manager. Um, or if you don't have a property manager and you manage it yourself, I think you still need to factor in what is that cost because you need to be paying yourself for your time. Hey, you Joe, want to fact yes, sir. Do you have a factor that you use if, if you're like just researching a property and you don't know the, the taxes off the top of my head, is there a factor you use? Um, no, I usually, um, when I'm looking at a specific property, I plug in the actual taxes from, um, the, from RE Colorado, or I look it up on the county assessor website. And then for insurance, you know, if it's a, if it's a condo, like that's what this is, um, I use about, uh, what is it, 15 bucks a month. Um, I have an, an HO6 policy on my condos that's really, really reasonable. I think it's like 150 to 200 bucks a year. Um, so, no, I don't have a factor other than just, having done a bunch of transactions. Yeah. I used to have a factor back East in Pennsylvania, you could 0.2% and it was spot on for, hmm. uh, I'm sorry, for homeowners insurance, not the, uh, Oh, for homeowners. Yeah. I meant, I meant the homeowners insurance because, you know, with here, with the, with the, the, obviously the chain, you know, the down payments, it, it can be anywhere from 1% to, you know, on up and, and so forth. So insurance is so different here with our hailstorms and stuff like that. Yeah, absolutely. So the next thing you want to include is repairs and maintenance. Now you may not have to make repairs to the property every year, but you need to be setting some money aside for that. So you've got some cash when something happens at the property. Now this particular property did have a homeowners association of $108 a month. So total annual expenses, $3,638. Now the mortgage payment, $0.0. .0. Remember we paid cash. We did not take out a new mortgage. So annual cash flow on this property, $7,762. And that, that means our cash on cash and our cap rate 
are basically going to be exactly the same because our cash on cash is this $7,700 divided by our total cash investment. And our cap rate is this $7,700 of net operating income divided by our cash purchase and renovation. All right. So looking at that, we paid cash. Not surprising that that cash on cash and cap rate are really similar. So what are the benefits of paying cash for a property? Number, number one, um, we're getting a really great cap rate, 7.4% cap rate. No loan qualifying. We did not have to mess with any pesky lenders. We didn't have to put in bank statements or paycheck stubs or anything like that. And the big benefit, no monthly mortgage payments. So we get a ton of cash flow over here. But there's some downsides. You might only be able to buy just a few properties, okay? And you need a large amount of money. Now, $100,000, that's a big number in my world. Um, not sure about everybody else's world, but that's a lot of money to invest, and it's going to tie up a lot of your money. Now, let me ask you guys, going through this, there's one piece of feedback that I get on this slide every time. Any guesses what it is? What are you guys supposed to say when we're going through this? These properties don't exist anymore. Joe, there's no <laughs> such thing as a $100,000 condo. And uh, that's true, except for the ones that are out there. And so a really important thing that I'm gonna show you guys, everything we're gonna look at today is a closed transaction. And I'm gonna tell you where it was found. So this property was on the MLS. Um, and every one of these properties we're gonna look at today has closed within the last 12 months. So this was during our really strong seller's market and there was less than 0.9 months of inventory. And then the follow-up question to that is everybody's gonna say, well, where is this? This is in Denver proper, all right? So this is a small condo, studio apartment or studio condo, really good, low HOA. Um, these are not, you know, they're not out there by the millions, by the dozens, but they are out there. So everything I'm gonna show you guys today is a real transaction, but uh, hopefully that, that helps you guys understand this is not just theory everything we're going to look at are real transactions so scenario number two purchase a property with 15 percent down using a conventional loan so my one of my favorite questions is what is the minimum down payment on an investment property most folks thinks think that it is 20 or even 25 percent that is actually incorrect you can purchase with as little as 15 percent down for an investment property so let's say you purchase the property with for $263,000 and we give you a loan for 85% of that. So you're putting 15% down, $39,450. Now you're going to have some closing costs. All right. You're going to have the same closing costs that you had in scenario number one. We've got to pay title insurance. We've got to pay the closing fee, HOA if it's there, uh, homeowner's insurance, taxes, et cetera. But you're also going to have some costs associated with the loan. And when you're doing less money down, you might have a little bit higher closing costs. So walking out of First Alliance title, I have spent $45,950 to purchase this property. Now, let's say it needs $6,000 worth of renovation. Not a lot, all right? Again, this is, this is for, I think this was a single family home. Um, this is probably just paint and maybe just, you know, a refresh of carpet cleaning, things like that, probably not replacing any carpet. So total cash invested in the transaction, $51,950. And let's look at our cash flow statement. This property rents for $2,250 a month, which is $27,000 a year, minus vacancy, minus our expenses for property taxes, insurance, property management is more expensive because we're renting the property for a higher amount. I always estimate 10% of your monthly rents towards your property management. Uh, repairs and maintenance, and I misspoke earlier, this was actually uh, was a condo. So 3,168, the uh, HOA dues are about 285 or about 275 a month, I believe, on this property. So total annual expenses, roughly $8,500. So the first thing we're going to see is that net operating income of $17,000. Now that net operating income is what we use to calculate this cap rate. All right, net operating income divided by the purchase price plus the renovation gives us that 6.4% cap rate. Pretty good deal. But we've now got to pay our two biggest expenses, all right, which is the mortgage payment 
and mortgage insurance. Now everybody says, well, wait a minute, Joe, I don't want to pay mortgage insurance. Okay, I get that, but let's not forget you're putting 15% down, so you will have monthly mortgage insurance even on an investment property. Plus the mortgage payment is going to give you annual cash flow of a whopping $483, $40, off, killing it. Now, Jared, let me ask you, what would you buy this deal, Jared? You're going to cash flow yeah, 40 bucks a month? 6.4% return yeah. rate? Hell yeah. That's right. Your cash on cash is really low, but let's think about it for a minute. You're not putting very much money down, all right? You're putting down only $51,000 as compared to scenario number one, we were investing $100,000, all right? Now we're getting less cash flow, but we've invested quite a bit less. But what else are we going to get? Likely property appreciation, Jeez. likely yeah. increased rents, lots of value of owning real estate over the long term. So big benefits here, we get a 6.4% cap rate, much less cash into the deal, which allows us to buy many more properties. But what are the downsides? Not great cash flow, all right? If you're buying for cash flow only, you're probably gonna have to put down more than this 15%. And you do have to qualify for a new loan. Those pesky lenders, those guys are gonna ask you for bank statements, paycheck stubs, et cetera. And vacancies will have more of an impact because when that property is vacant, you still have to pay the mortgage payment every single month. And depending on the level of finish, if the property's in bad shape, it might not qualify for financing. Now this transaction um, is another real transaction that was closed. My client found it on the MLS again during this really strong seller's market with 1.4 months of inventory now let's talk about what if we want to put more money down and try and cash flow a little bit better so let's say we want to do 25 percent down and a little tip i'll give you guys for where you can find some really good properties look for single family homes with basement apartments all right and let's walk through this scenario two hundred seventy-five thousand dollars purchase price they put 25% down. So we gave them a loan of 206,250. And they needed 25%, 68,750. Closing costs are a little less, right? Because they're putting more money down, a little bit less in closing costs. Total cash, walking out of First Alliance title, they've invested $72,450. But this property needed $25,000 of renovation. So what they did is they had to put some egress windows in the basement, they had to put a kitchenette in the basement. They had to put a, a lock off. There was a separate entrance into the basement, but they had to put a lock off door in between the upstairs and downstairs and the stairwell. So it could be, you know, an upstairs unit and then a downstairs unit with a separate entrance. So total investment, $97,450. Now, how does this property cash flow? $3,400 a month. So let's think about that for a moment. That is $2,200 for the upstairs unit and $1,200 for the basement unit. Now, Jared, you look at a lot of properties. Do you see things out there that have uh, an upstairs and potential one or two bedrooms in the basement these days? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of these out there. A lot on the west side of town, Wheat Ridge, Lakewood, yeah. um, West Denver, you know, 80219. I think the entire, all of 80219 has a, a single family with a basement apartment. They're, they're everywhere. So we're going to have about $40,000 a year of rents, minus our 5% vacancy, minus property taxes, minus homeowner's insurance. We're gonna pay that property manager 10%. We're gonna have a reserve for repairs and maintenance with and no HOA, because this is a single family home with no HOA. Total annual expenses, roughly $8,150. So our net operating income is this $30,610 into our purchase price plus our renovation gives us a 10.2% cap rate. Jared, is that a good deal? Man, that's, I haven't seen that in years. <laughs> but now what did they have to do, all right? It wasn't just sitting on the MLS for everybody to come along and buy. They had to go look at it. They had to pick through a number of different properties and they had to find the right property that had that basement apartment or that basement that they could convert into a basement apartment, okay? And after paying the mortgage, annual cash flow, $16,943, which gives them a 17% cash on cash return. Pretty good deal? Hey Joe, 
you know, and you in in this scenario, tell me if I'm wrong, but that's a that was a long term rent for the base, long term lease for the basement. So if you that's took that, if you lived in it and went to short term, it's probably going to be even higher. That's correct. So this is something that I have a lot of clients that would buy something like this, and then they live in the basement and Airbnb the upstairs, and they might rent it out for four thousand a month. Now you're going to have some vacancy, right? But if you're doing Airbnb, or you may be doing like a nurse, like a travel nurse rental on like a ninety day. Uh, 90 day lease term, you can get higher rents and higher premiums on things like that. So this number of 3,400, this is long term. Uh, yep. Those are long term rents. You're exactly right. Now, big benefits here: great cap rate, great cash flow. However, you have to qualify for a new loan, and depending on the condition of the property, it might not qualify for financing. Now, where did they find this property? Another real transaction that was on the MLS with 1.2 months of inventory okay any questions so far i didn't look at the chat box nothing. is there anything in the chat box i should talk about jared nope nothing all right great okay. so let's keep going here let's talk about the scenario of purchasing with a hard money loan all right number one thing you need to do is locate the property and you want to make sure that it's in a good rental or good cash flow area then you're going to get that property under contract and you're gonna prepare your repair budget, go through your analysis, and you need to make sure that that property has sufficient equity, all right? Meaning that there's enough of a gap between what you're gonna pay, how much you're gonna to spend to repair it, what is that after repaired value, all right? And that's what this number is, ARV. And so you're gonna get a hard money acquisition loan. We have a number of hard money lenders that we work with, and they'll loan you up to 70% of that after repaired value. Now don't get too stuck on that 70% number right now. I'm going to walk you through an example here in a moment. After you close on the hard money loan, you're going to fix up the property. Then you're going to get a tenant who's going to rent out the property. Then you're going to refinance that. You call me and say, hey, Joe, we've rented out the property. We've completed our renovations. We're now ready to refinance into our permanent loan. And we're going to loan you up to 75% of that new appraised value. Then you simply hire a management company or manage the property yourself. So let's go through a specific. This one's quite a bit more complicated, but it's a really great way to build wealth. So this property was a duplex and it had an 885 ARV. And this is how you're going to purchase it with a short term loan and then refinance it into permanent conventional financing. So purchase price was $370,000. Now, Jared, if the purchase price is $370,000, and the ARV is 885. Does that tell you anything about the property? Needs a lot of work. It was busted, all yeah. right? It cost them $175,000 to renovate the property, all right? And guess what? $175,000 renovation, that does not happen in five minutes. This was like an eight month project, I believe. Closing costs, $27,250. Holy cow, why are the closing costs so high? Do you know, Jared? Uh, points. That's right. It's a hard money loan. Yep. All right. So that hard money lender is loaning you the purchase price plus the renovation plus the closing costs all based on this after repaired value. So the loan amount was actually greater than the purchase price. All right. So that hard money lender is taking a pretty big risk because they're, they're lending you $572,000 on a property that you're only paying $370,000 for they're gonna want some points to be compensated for that. But here's the big benefit. Leaving First Alliance title with the keys to the property, this client put down zero dollars. The hard money lender lent them 100% of the price, the renovation, and the closing costs. Now, they did make payments on this hard money loan during the renovation. So their payments were $5,700 a month, really high because hard money loans are expensive and it took them eight months to do the renovation. So they had $45,000 of total holding costs while they were doing the renovation. After they completed the renovation, they called me up and said, hey, Joe, we're ready to refi. We've got our tenant, our property is done. We've completed all the work, fantastic. We're gonna pay off that hard money loan. We do include the closing costs into their new refinance with me. So their new total loan amount on their permanent loan was $580,000. So guess what they needed for the renovation? Pardon me, for the refinance? Zero dollars, okay? So their total investment is the total of these three numbers, 
$45,600. Let's do the math on that real quick. An $885,000 value of the property and $45,000 down, that means they invested what, just over 5%, almost 6% down. So Jared, let me ask you, do you know anywhere you can go and put 6% down and buy an investment property duplex? No. No, this is about the only way to do it. But what's the trade-off? They had to do a lot of work, right? They renovated this property for eight months, okay? Now let's look at the cash flow statement. So it rents out for 5,800 a month, which is uh, $2,900 per side, minus vacancy, minus property taxes, minus insurance, management, relatively expensive, but we're still paying 10% to our property manager to take care of all the issues, reserves for repairs and maintenance, total annual expenses, $17,000, for a net operating income of $48,768. Divide that into that 885 ARV. That is a 6.3% cap rate. Pretty good deal, Jared. What do you think? Yeah. I mean, yeah, pretty solid. Out of pocket? I mean, you, where are you going to find that? Yeah, pretty solid. And so they are making cash flow $9,250 a year on a $45,000 investment, that's a 20% cash on cash return. All right. I don't know if anybody here got 20% in your IRA or your, your 401k last year. I know that I did not. Um, so this is a minus. great way. Yeah, you were, I was minus 20%. Yeah. All right. Now, this was another real transaction that was purchased from a wholesaler. All right. And Jared, I think you work with a lot of wholesale transactions, right? You, yeah. Yeah. And this was in a seller's market with one and a half months of inventory. So lots of inventory when they bought this. Okay. Yeah. Wow. I'm texting answers Jill's question. She said, were they flippers or did they have to pay contractors in and retail? So um, this being the wholesale transaction, you obviously get a little bit of a discount in retail. Yeah. yeah. So this was uh, this is a client who normally does fix and flips and found this property and looked at it as a fix and flip, but then looked at how much the rents were and said, boy, I'm going to keep this. Um, because it's a really, really good rental property. And now he's got this duplex for 885 that's gonna be going up in value um, probably pretty significantly because it's tough to find good renovated duplexes in the Denver area. Really good question there. Were there any other questions that I saw? That's it. Okay. So let's talk about the benefits of scenario number three of purchasing with that hard money loan. Number one, you're getting a really, really high rate of return, okay? Because you're putting a really low amount of money down you can get a really high rate of return, which is gonna allow you to put less cash in and purchase more and more properties. So you're gonna get really good cash flow with very little investment. However, it's more difficult to qualify for the loan because you're doing two loans, right? You're doing a hard money loan and you're doing that permanent loan with me. You've got less equity, especially while you're going through the renovation, meaning there's more leverage and I like to translate that to more stress on the investor. And vacancies have a much higher impact. While that property is vacant during the renovation, you're paying that full $5,700 a month in monthly payment to the hard money lender. And you need to understand, you may not have to put cash into the deal, but you need to have some cash. So if you're watching this today and you've got 20 bucks in your pocket and you say, this is great, I wanna buy an $885,000 duplex and renovate it, this might not be for you you need to have some money or your partners need to have some money because there are always things that can come up when you're renovating a property. Now, the last point is the appraisal is the key determining factor on the approval of the loan. You need to be prepared to bring some money to the closing. You should expect to put anywhere from three to 15% into the transaction. And if we look at the transaction we just looked at, it was right about 6% investment because of the carrying costs while they were doing the renovation. Hey, Joe, they, um, yeah. Jill um, asked a, another part of her question. She said, what do you estimate it would have cost for someone who is not a flipper and doesn't have a crew? Um, that I don't know. Um, that's a little bit outside the scope of what I do. But I do know that these guys, while they are fixing flippers, they hire outside contractors. They don't have on staff, uh, you know, con- uh, on staff carpenters or on staff plumbers or anything like that. So they have uh, a GC that they work with. Um, so I would imagine that these costs are 
pretty close to real world costs, even for a retail investor. Um, and I know these guys do have, have good relationships with their contractors, so maybe they get a little bit of a deal, uh, but I'm certain that their, their contractors were not working for free. So really a great question. Thank you. Now, important to understand, this scenario that we looked at is best case. It is a real scenario, it is a real client that closed on a real property, but your results might be different. And there's a number of factors that can go into that and you need to be prepared to put cash into the transaction. You can just never guarantee that you're gonna be able to do this with no money down. And again, that appraisal is the real, real key factor to determine that approval. All right, let's talk about scenario number four. So this is another single family home with a basement apartment. And this was purchased as a primary residence for $375,000. Now they put down 5% and we loaned them 95%. Now I told you guys just a little while ago that minimum down payment for an investment property is 15%. There's an important distinction here. This is their primary residence, meaning that the client is living there. So in that case, they can put down 5%. They could even do FHA with 3.5% or uh, first-time home buyer chaffa as little as $1,000 down. But in this case, they put 5% down. They did have some closing costs, of course, roughly $6,500. Walking out of First Alliance title with the keys, they spent $25,250. And this property only needed about $4,000 of renovation. So total investment into that transaction $29,250. Now, annual rental income, this is gonna blow your mind, $3,795. So this is pretty crazy to me and not something that I would do, but it's something that these guys do or that this individual does. So he lives in the basement apartment, which has three bedrooms. He lives in one bedroom and rents out the other two bedrooms to his two roommates and each of the roommates pays $650 a month. All right, so $1,300 for the two roommates to live in the basement. He lives in the third bedroom in the basement. The upstairs rents out for $2,495. So it is a total of $3,795 per month. But it's important to understand that, yes, that's a great number, but that's an uncomfortable living situation. So I would not do that. Uh, Jared, I'm assuming you're not in a position that you would wanna move into a basement apartment with two roommates, right? not at 53 years old and being married <laughs> no but for a lot of your clients out there a lot of clients will do this because they're already living with two roommates they're already in tight living quarters they could do this and start making a lot of money and building a lot of wealth so it's important to understand this concept so annual rental income roughly forty five thousand dollars minus vacancy minus property taxes minus insurance there is no management because most managers are not going to manage a property that you're living in. So they are self-managing. Factor in the cost for repairs and maintenance, $6,357 uh, total expenses, which gives us $36,900 in net operating income. Okay, so pretty solid net operating income. And then they've got to pay the mortgage of $21,000 gives us annual cash flow of $14,000 a year. On our investment of 29,000, that is a 50% cash on cash return. But really an important point here, they are living for free and they're generating a profit. Well, this investor is really, really smart. So what he does is he says, you know, my two roommates and my tenants upstairs are paying my mortgage, but I've got to live somewhere. So he says, you know, even though they're paying the mortgage for me, I'm still going to make a mortgage payment every month. But instead of making that mortgage payment to the mortgage company, he saves it. So he takes that $21,000 a year of mortgage payment and puts it back into his bank. So every year he gets $14,000 of cash flow and he puts $21,000 of his mortgage payment back into his own bank. So he saves up $36,900 a year. That is an annual cash on cash return of 124%. So if you're saving greater than 100% of what it costs you to do the transaction, how many transactions could you do each year? You could do another one of these every 12 months, right? Because it's your primary residence, you've got to live there for 12 months, but after you've saved up enough money down, do it again. It's a great way for young people. If you have young people living in your basement and you want them out, 
guess what? Mom and dad could give this money as a gift for the down payment. Or if you have clients that have young people living in their basement and mom and dad want them out, you can talk with mom and dad about how we can help Junior buy their first property with a gift for down payment. So it's a great option for young people that are already living with roommates or living in mom and dad's basement. Great option to help them move on with their life and start building wealth. I now, love that. Yeah, these are great scenarios. So big benefits, super low down payment, only 5% down, great cash flow, but there is a big negative. You have to live with your tenant, all right? A lot of people don't wanna do this. Um, you need to be disciplined to save your payment. So this right here, this $21,000, if they're not disciplined and they are taking that money and just going to Las Vegas and gambling it away, they're not gonna build up a lot of wealth, okay? And you need to live there for a minimum of 12 months. And this is another closed transaction that we found on the MLS with 1.4 months of inventory. And I'm actually closing a lot of these right now, I'll probably close one to two to three of these every single month. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities out there for these single family with basement apartments. All right, now we know the ways to buy properties. Actually, let me pause. Any questions or anything, anybody disagree with anything on the ways that we're, the four ways to buy properties? Questions, thoughts, disagreements? Feel free to unmute yourself. Okay, great. I'm the smartest presenter ever. No, just kidding, guys. I hope this is all making sense. All right. So let's keep going. We know the ways to buy properties. Let's help our clients start buying them. Now we've got to assume a few things as we start. Number one, the client does not own any real estate. Now your client might be in a different position or you might be in a different position, but we had to kind of pick a starting point. Now let's say the client and their spouse have a full-time job and or self-employment generating $100,000 per year in, this is important, reportable income. So income that's on their tax returns. They have saved up $100,000 in their 401k or IRA or retirement plan. They have a 740 credit score. They have the discipline to save 10% per year in their 401k and 10% of their income into their savings. All cash flows from properties is gonna be saved and reinvested. They've got discipline. They can handle the purchase and renovation of only one new property at a time. So we're not gonna try and do two or three or five at a time, one at a time. And all properties are gonna be managed by the property manager except for the primary residence. And the client has saved up $100,000 to invest into their real estate portfolio. Now, really important, you or your client's starting point most likely is different. But this is a basic example, and this is actually a real world client that I have. And your strengths or weaknesses could be different. Your strengths or weaknesses, maybe you have more money to invest, so you might achieve uh, 10 properties sooner, or maybe you have less to invest, so it might take you longer, all right? So there's lots of variables that go in there. And I think, did I see a question in the chat box? Yeah, 203K for rehab costs. Yep, you can do a 203K for rehab costs. Um, here's the challenge in this market is we're still at really low inventory. What's months of inventory right now, Jared? Is it less than two One, still? 1.8. Yeah, 1.8. So 203K, the transaction time from the loan standpoint is our normal um, you know, 15 to 21 day transaction. But on a 203K, you've got to have a contractor um, and a lot of times they're going to take three weeks, four weeks, five weeks to get you your bid, to get you your scope of work. Many sellers are not going to be willing to wait for that right now. But the answer is yes, you could absolutely do a 203K. But in practical purposes, the last time I had a seller accept a 203K contract was in 2012. Um, low inventory does not bode well for 203K financing, but actually a very excellent question. And maybe if you're working in Wyoming or Nebraska or some outlying areas, you could uh, potentially get some, some success with 203K loans. Maybe one of like an off-market property, Joe, if it's, if it's not point. an market property and, you know, I think that's a scenario for that situation. Really good point. Really good point. All right, let's make a few assumptions about the market. Number one, average appreciation of 5% per year. In prior years in Denver, we were at 7%, 10%, 12%. Last year, I think we were like plus 3%. This year, we're probably gonna be flat. But over the last 40 years, the average has been 6%. But for our purposes of this analysis, we're gonna assume that properties are gonna go up at 5% per year. 
we're going to assume 5% annual vacancy. That's recently been as low as 2.5%. I think it's even lower than that right now, but we're going to assume, worst case, 5% annual vacancy. 5% annual rent increases. Recently, it's been as high as 10, 15% in some pockets, some pockets of the Denver area, but we're going to again take worst case scenario and assume 5% annual rent increase. And we're going to assume 3% annual inflation. Uh, I need to update my slide. Currently, is like 4.5%. <laughs> uh, but the national average is right around 3.5%. We're going to assume 10% property management fee. And then interest rates for these scenarios, your individual rate could be higher or lower depending on your personal qualifications and market conditions. But as of today, um, I just updated all of this. Conventional loans are at 6.75 for primary residents, 7.125 if you're putting down 25% on an investment property, 7.375 on an investment property with 20% down, 7.875 on an investment property with 15% down and 13% for a hard money loan in the current market. Now, again, yours might be higher or lower, and we're going to go, above, go through a bunch of real scenarios and real interest rates, but this is where we would stand as of today. All right, so let's look at our first property. So right up here, January 1st, year number one, the client has $100,000 in savings, $100,000 in 401k, absolute zero cash flow. They are a first-time buyer. They're gonna purchase a primary residence. They're gonna buy a single family with a basement apartment. They're gonna rent the upstairs uh, plus two bedrooms in the basement. They're gonna pay 375 for this. Main level rent is 1875 and basement 960 per room, but they're only renting two bedrooms and they're living in one bedroom. And this property needs really light renovation, cleaning, paint, carpet, et cetera, so not much. Purchase price 375, 95% loan, closing costs, walking out of First Alliance title, they spent $25,250. Plus renovation, total investment in cash, $29,250. Their cash flow statement, this is the same one we looked at just a few minutes ago. They're cash flowing $14,000 a year. And this individual is really, really smart. He says, you know what? Even though my tenants are paying my mortgage, I'm still going to make a mortgage payment and put that amount of money back into my savings. So he's paying that just from his regular W-2 job. He makes $100,000 a year. And from that check he gets every month, he pays himself that mortgage payment, which equates to $21,979 per year. So his annual savings and cash flow, $36,900. So at the end of February, or the beginning of February, his savings balance has gone down. His 401k balance has gone up and we're not assuming any market appreciation. We're just assuming that the market, the stock market in his 401k just does zero, but he's still putting money in there. And his annual cash flow, 14,927. But the savings is a kind of a separate line that that money's still going into this savings balance. Now, the next month, he wants to buy another property. And he says, you know what? I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna purchase a property using a hard money loan and then refinance it into permanent financing. So he buys a single family home and pays $155,000. Now you're supposed to say at this point, Joe, where in the world does he find a single family home for $155,000? This property was in Pueblo. All right, one of my clients purchased this just a couple months ago. They spent about $20,000 in renovation and it had a 250 ARV and it did take them three months to renovate it. Purchase price $155,000 plus $20,000 in renovation. $8,500 in closing costs. Their total loan amount from the hard money lender was one seventy-five. That is 70% of this ARV. So guess what? They had to put some money down. They had to invest $8,500. Okay, so about 4% as the down payment on that 250 ARV. A few months later, they called me and said, okay, Joe, we're ready to refinance. We paid off their existing loan, included closing costs into the loan. New loan amount of $179,400. They needed $0 to complete the refinance. However, they did have to pay three months of hard money payments at $21.87 per month times three months, cost them $6,500 in total holding costs. 
total investment into the deal, 15,063. That is the down payment plus the holding costs, okay? Hmm. Now, they got the property rented out, annual rent, roughly $20,000 a year, minus taxes, insurance, management, repairs, net operating income, $14,000, minus the mortgage payment, cash flowing a whopping $1,695. That's a 5.6% cash uh, cap rate. Good deal, Jared, would you buy this deal? Yeah. Yeah. Anything, over, deal. anything over 5% is solid. That's right. These days. That's right. And let's not forget the amount of equity they got in the property. All right. They yeah. put in $20,000 worth of work, but they now have what? 179 minus 250. They've got $71,000 of equity in the property. Okay. So it's not huge cash flow from a dollar standpoint, but really, really good equity. Now it took them a few months. So here we are on June 1st. They've got $72,000 in savings, 401k balances growing and annual cash flow of roughly $16,000. So now remember they can only handle one property at a time. So what do they do? They go out and they buy property number three. They've got $72,000 in savings. They purchase a condo with just light renovation and they put 25% down. So this is the same example we saw earlier with a $100,000 price an HOA of 108 per month. 100,000 price, we gave them a loan for 75,000, down payment was $25,000, plus $4,000 in closing costs, walking out of First Alliance title with the keys, they spent $29,000. It cost them $5,500 to do really light renovation. Total investment, 34,500. Property is renting out for $1,000 a month, minus vacancy, taxes, insurance, property management, repairs, HOA, net operating income of 7,700 minus the mortgage, they're cash flowing $2,792 per year at a 7.4% cap rate. Jared, good deal, what do you think? All day, every day. Yeah, solid deal, right? Solid deal. At the end of that month, they've got 45,105 in 401k, $19,000 in annual cash flow. Now at this point, the investor says, you know what, that's kind, that's three properties in eight months. That's kind of a lot of work. Let's take the rest of the year off. So at the end of the year, we review and property number one has gone up in value. The mortgage balance has gone down. They're building equity in that property. They've got cash flow of 14,928 and savings in lieu of that payment of $21,000. Now they've got property number two that they've got value of 262,000. So it's gone up a little bit, not as much because they haven't owned it as long as property number one, but they're building a little bit of equity there. Cash flow, not crazy, but still solid, nothing wrong with that. And then property number three, value's only gone up just a small fraction because they've only owned it for a few months, but they've got some equity in it and annual cash flow 2792. So let's look at our portfolio total. They have three properties owned, three doors rented, $761,000 in total value, $611,000 in outstanding mortgages, their cash balance, $63,000, 401k, 110,000, net cash flow, $19,000. Their annual savings is $10,000, because remember they're making $100,000 a year and they're saving 10% of their annual pay to invest in real estate and back here, the savings from their mortgage payment on property number one. I'd say they're doing pretty well at the end of one year. What do you think, Jared? Heck yeah. Pretty solid. solid start. So property number, or year number two, let's get started. They've got $63,000 in savings. They're gonna purchase the next property using hard money and refinance into permanent financing. So this property was a duplex with a $169,000 price. Now you're supposed to say, where in the world did they find a duplex for $169,000? My favorite answer for some of these high spread deals, also Pueblo, okay? Needed $39,000 of renovation with a 320 ARV. So purchase price 169, renovation 39,000, 11,000 in closing costs, 220 total loan amount means they brought 
zero money to the closing. So walking out of First Alliance title with the keys, they invested zero dollars. They called me a few months later and said, Joe, we're ready to refi. Let's pay off that hard money loan, include the closing costs, cash needed to do that refinance, zero dollars. However, they did have to pay the hard money lender $2,750 every month for three months, meaning they invested $8,250 in holding costs. So then they rented out the property for $1,350 per side, minus vacancy, minus taxes, minus insurance, property management, repairs and maintenance. This property has net operating income of $23,000 a year, minus the mortgage payment, 7.4% cap rate. Jared, good deal. What do you think? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Solid deal. 7,800 bucks per year in cash flow. At the only end of $8,200. That's right. They only invested <laughs> 8,200. So what's that a 90% or 85% cash on cash return? Pretty solid. Okay. Yeah. Now what's the downside? They had to drive to Pueblo to renovate the property. Okay, so there was, there was some work associated with it. It wasn't free. So now in May, we've got 77,000, 29,000 in cash flow. Let's go out and buy another property. Let's purchase a new property with 15% down. Let's just buy a $263,000 condo with an HOA and $6,000 of renovation, 263 price, 223 loan amount. We loaned them 85%. They put 15% down plus their closing costs gives us total cash, walking out of First Alliance title with an investment of 45,950. Took $6,000 to renovate the property, their total cash into the deal, $51,950. This property rents for $2,250 a month, minus taxes, minus interior insurance, property management, repairs and maintenance, 264 per month HOA, Net operating income, $17,000. By the time they pay the mortgage, they're cash flowing a whopping $40 a month, $483 a year. Jared, why would they buy this? 40 bucks a month, that, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Why buy this? Joe, that is the biggest mistake that you see in real estate investing is when people only invest for annual cash. Biggest mistake. I agree. I agree. Because they're getting a lot of other benefits, right? Yeah. What happens to rent over the long term? Which direction does it go? Repeat that. What happens to rent over the long term? Which direction does it rent goes go? Up. It only goes up. What happens to property prices over the long term? Oh. Goes up. What happens to all of these expenses over the long term? Also goes up. But what's the biggest expense that doesn't change? The mortgage. You get your mortgage on a 30-year fix at today's dollars. Everybody's worried about inflation. Guess what? That is inflation protected, does not go up, okay? And so everything else is gonna increase, which is gonna increase your profit. And guess what? Your biggest expense stays exactly the same. So while this may not be huge cash flow today, it could be really, really good cash flow in the future. And you could have a really solid appreciating property that you did not invest a lot of money into. So I think you're exactly right. Don't get tripped up looking only at cash flow. Or if all you're looking at is cash flow, don't put 15% down. Put 25, 30, 40% down, and then this number will be stronger. All right. I just had a question. She said, yeah. uh, pardon my ignorance, but they but they do the refi after to pay off the loan and get a different type of loan, or what's the reason? Oh yeah, so I think you're talking about um, the prior scenario. Let's go back one here. So why do you do the refinance right here? Because your hard money loan that you're taking out here, hard money loans generally have a limit of six to maybe 12 month term. And at the end of that term, that loan is due. And so your hard money lender, they're loaning you the purchase price, the renovation and the closing costs, but they want their money back within six months or 12 months. So after and all the renovation is 13, 14%. <laughs> right, they're charging you 13%, they're charging you four points on the front. And when you're done with your renovation, they say, hey, you know what, Iris, you got to refinance because we want to be paid off. And that's where I come in and will pay off that existing refinance loan and give you a new loan 
so that you're moving forward uh, at that point uh, with a regular 30 year fixed rate loan. So great question. I hope I hope I answered that. Okay, let's keep going here. So back to scenario number five. At the end of July, We've got $35,000 in cash, $30,000 in cash flow. Let's go out and buy another property using a hard money loan and then refinance it into permanent financing. Let's buy a single family home, 165 price, $25,000 of medium renovation, 270 ARV. This was in, um, what's the, what's in between Colorado Springs and, and Pueblo? Is it Fort, is it Florissant? I think it's Florissant is where this was at. Um, I might, I might have that wrong, but in between Colorado Springs and Pueblo, there's kind of some rural towns in there. That's where this property was purchase price, 165, $25,000 of renovation, closing costs, 9,500, 189 total loan amount, meaning they had to bring $10,500. They had to bring that with them to first Alliance title in order to get the keys. They did the renovation, called me up and said, Hey, Joe, we're ready to refinance and pay off that hard money loan. Total new loan amount, $194,000. They needed $0 to refinance. Now, they did have to pay that hard money lender, $2,362 times three months, $7,087 in total holding costs for total cash into the deal, $17,587. So how does this work for rents? $2,160 per year in rents minus taxes, minus insurance, minus management, minus repairs, $14,000 net operating income. This property is cash flowing a whopping $1,000. I don't think we need to beat this dead horse anymore. Jared, this is still a good deal because they're going to get appreciation. They've built a ton of equity. They've got greater than $70,000 of equity. I would do this transaction, Jared, would you? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think so too. Okay. At the end of December, excuse me, beginning of December, they've completed all their work on this property and let's get to the end of the year and review. Property number one has gone up in value. Mortgage balance is being paid down. They're building equity. Cash flows have gone up. Why does cash flow go up? Because rents generally increase. What doesn't increase? The biggest expense, the mortgage. Property number two has gone up in value. Annual cash flow has gone up a little bit. Property number three has gone up in value. Annual cash flow has gone up a little bit. Property number four went up a little bit. We didn't own it that long, but a little bit of appreciation. Property number five gone up just a little bit. We've only owned it a few months. And property six didn't go up very much in appreciation because we've only had the renovation finished for about a month. But in total, six properties owned, seven doors rented, $1.6 million in total value, $1.2 million in mortgages, $44,000 in cash, $120,000 in our 401k, $31,000 in cash flow, $31,000 in annual savings. Now, I know we're getting close to an hour here. Um, if you guys want to stick with me, that would be great. Um, I always try and get this in for an hour, but don't want to go too fast. Um, so we'd love if you guys can stick with us for another 10 minutes or so. But if anybody that has to drop off, um, please feel free to follow up with myself or Jared. We'll be happy to answer any one-on-one -on -one questions. All right, let's buy property number seven. Let's purchase a condo that needs some rehab. $125,000 price, $1,200 a month in rent. $12,000 in medium renovation. 125 price, they put 25% down, down payment of 31,250. Closing costs, $3,250. Walking out of First Alliance title with the keys, $34,500. $12,000 to renovate the property. It cost them $46,000 to acquire and renovate this property. Now it rents for $1,200 a month. Minus vacancy, minus taxes, minus insurance, minus management, minus repairs, minus HOA dues, gives us net operating income $8,270. We've got to pay the mortgage $2,000 a year in cash flow. All right, Jared, killing it, $2,000 a month or $2,000 a year, excuse me. Is that a huge yep. cash flow? I love it. Yeah, it's not, not enough to retire on, but you know what you're getting? Lots of appreciation, lots of rent growth. Let's not forget about tax benefits. Lots of reasons to own real estate, okay? 
All right. We got a question. I don't. I, a question. Question. I believe you said you would show us how to search the properties in the MLS. <laughs> um, no, that's actually where you guys come in. So <laughs> that's uh, that's where the real estate agents are really going to offer that expertise. You know, everything that I do is is really showing you about the financing and how this works. Um, but I can tell you, I have done some searches for my own individual properties out there, and uh, I have found some of these deals out there. Now they're not they're not just lying around by the dozen, by the thousands. But these transactions are out there and every one of these transactions we're looking at uh, is a real transaction and that's where your guys expertise as the real estate agents uh, will come in to help your clients find these transactions okay so let's keep going here oops so now we're into april we've got nineteen thousand dollars in savings not a whole lot of savings so what do we do we wait about six months, okay? Now we're into August, excuse me, now we're into October and we've saved up $55,000. Let's go buy property eight. We're a little tired of renovations. So let's just buy a turnkey rental property. Let's pay $140,000 for the condo, $1,250 a month in rent, HOA, $1,000 of renovation. Anything that's $1,000, I describe as turnkey. That's the cost to clean it and get a tenant in there. Purchase price, $140,000, 25% down, 35,000, 3,500 in closing costs. Walking out of First Alliance title, $38,500 total cash to purchase that property. Renovation of $1,000, $39,000 to purchase that property and get it rent ready. Now it rents for $1,250 a month, $15,000 a year, minus vacancy, minus taxes, minus insurance, minus property management, minus repairs, minus HOAs. This property has net operating income of $8,680. Have to pay the mortgage. We're cash flowing $1,700 per year. Again, you're not setting the world on fire with $140, $150 a month in cash flow, but lots of benefits to owning these properties over the long term. All right, now we're down to $21,000 in savings, but our cash flow is up to like $41,000. So Jared, if I get down to $21,000, is that enough money that I can go out and buy a new investment property if I've only got $21,000 saved up to invest? Nope, time to refi. That's right, it's time to go out and get more cash. So a couple things that my clients love to do. They give me a call and say, Joe, I want to get a new home equity line of credit on my primary residence. Outstanding. We can help you with up to 90% of that value. So that value has been going up because you've owned that property for three years now. You've got a first mortgage. We'll give you a new HELOC for up to $60,000, which in this case had a payment interest only of $327 a month. But you've got to remember that decreases the cash flow because now you've got a higher mortgage payment because you've got a new second mortgage, that HELOC, your cash flow goes down. And then we've got some great partner lenders that can give you a HELOC on your investment property up to 70%. You get another $26,000 in cash. Cash flow goes down on property number two. So that cash flow decreases. At the end of the month, we've got now $113,000 in cash we've got $36,000 in annual cash flow. So let's review. Property number one at the end of the year, cash flow has gone down a little bit because we took out a new HELOC. Property number two, cash flow has gone down a little bit. Property number three, cash flow is increasing because rents generally go up. Number four, rents are going up. Number five, appreciating and rents are going up. Number six, appreciating and rents are going up. Number seven, appreciating and rents are going up. Number eight, appreciating and rents are going up. Our portfolio total, we have eight properties, nine doors, $2 million of total value, 1.5 in outstanding mortgages. We've got that cash from the HELOCs of $113,000. We've got our 401k built up, $36,000 of net cash flow, plus our savings, $31,980. Now, we've got a lot of cash in the bank. What is this gonna allow us to do? We've also got a lot of experience renovating properties. Let's go out and buy a duplex with that 885 ARV. 
We're going to purchase that duplex that needs extensive renovation using a hard money loan and then refinance it into permanent financing. So it's the same scenario we looked at earlier with that 370 price, 175 renovation, 885 ARV, but it takes us a long time to renovate that property. So we pay 370. Our hard money lender finances the renovation and they finance the closing costs. My new total loan amount, 572. Jared, thank you very much for this closing at First Alliance Title. I walk <laughs> out of there with the keys for zero dollars out of my pocket. Now, it. takes me 5,700 bucks every single month times eight months to hold that hard money loan while I'm doing the renovation. So I've got to invest about $45,000 for my 119 up here. Paying off my existing loan when it's time to refinance, factor in the closing costs, get a new loan from Joe Massey at Castle and Cook for $580,000, zero dollars to refinance. Total investment into the deal, $45,600, okay? All right, and we did get a question from Iris. I'm very new to hard money loans. What are the requirements to get a hard money loan approved? You know what, that's a great question. Um, the general requirement of a hard money loan, it's actually pretty simple. They're looking at what is this ARV and how does that line up with what you're paying? How much renovation you need? Do you have reserves? And do you have any major credit liens or problems? You could have really low credit, but as long as you don't have any tax liens or judgments or you're in the middle of a bankruptcy, they're not super, super concerned with your credit. They're also not super, super concerned with your income because what the hard money lender is looking at is if they loan you this money and you go out and you do this renovation, what is this property going to be worth? They're really looking at the deal, okay? So hard money lenders are gonna be um, pretty aggressive in their qualifications as compared to a conventional loan like what I do. But a really important point, if your plan to exit is to pay off that existing loan with a refinance, that hard money lender is gonna want you to have a pre-qualification or pre-approval from me because you're gonna say, hey, I'm gonna keep this property as a rental. They're gonna say, that's great. Call Joe and get your pre-approval letter so that we know that you can refinance as soon as you've completed all that renovation. Okay, so really, really important. We work really closely with several great hard money lenders. All right, this property is now rented out for $2,900 per side, $69,000 a year, minus vacancy, taxes, insurance, management, repairs, net operating income, $48,000 a year. Jared, let me ask you, 6.3% cap rate with a 6% total cash investment. Is that a good deal? Oh, yeah. Yeah, really solid. I would do that deal all day, every day. All day, every day. Cash flow, 9,200 bucks a year on a $45,000 investment. That's a 20% cash on cash return. At the end of the month, what do you know? Your savings is greater than when you started. So think about that. Your cash flow is completely paying the carrying costs. So at the end of your renovation, your cash flow has covered all of the carrying costs. Kind of cool. And your cash flow has now gone up even higher because you've rented this property out making $9,250 per year. Now, I did see a question here. To have that pre-approval, yeah, would it be more restrictive requirements since it would be a conventional loan? Correct. You absolutely do have to qualify for that conventional loan. Uh, or how do you work with a person who's wanting to do that and has no regular W-2 income? Well, that's a really great question, Iris. If you go back to, um, I think it was slide number 10 or 11, part of the assumptions that we've got here is you've got stable, reportable income. Doesn't have to be W-2, you could be self-employed. In fact, by and large, 35% of my clients are self-employed. As long as you're claiming that income on your tax returns and we can verify it, we can absolutely use that self-employment income. If you truly have no income or no reportable income, might be a great idea to do some of these strand, uh, some of these strategies with a partner. You know, one of the great ways that we see people build real estate wealth is having a partner that maybe is bringing some really solid income. Maybe you're bringing some really solid down payment and finding a way to work together in a partnership. But you definitely do have to qualify for this loan if you're planning to refinance out of that hard money loan. Excellent question. Now. 
We're into October. We've got a lot of savings built up. And you know what, Jared, at this point, I bet I'm pretty tired of living in that basement apartment with my two buddies, right? Yeah. Let's go out and buy a primary residence. Let's purchase a primary residence, single family, 600,000. Let's put 10% down. And we're going to rent out that third bedroom that we've been living in with our buddies. Now, rent has gone up, so we're going to be able to rent that out for about 1100 bucks a month. Purchase price on the home, $600,000, 540 loan amount, $60,000 down, plus closing costs. Walking out of the title company, Jared from First Alliance, thank you very much for the keys. Cost me $68,000. And this is a turnkey property, no renovation total cash, $68,000 spent. Now, why would you want to do this? What are the big benefits? You get to benefit from your hard work with a nice new home. Here's a big one, guys. You no longer have to live with your tenants and you can rent out that bedroom that you were living in for an additional $13,000 a year of gross income. But now you're going to have a property manager managing property number one. And now you're making a mortgage payment on this primary residence so you no longer have the freedom to save that $21,000 every year of the mortgage payment on the single family basement apartment that you're living in. So it's going to in, uh, decrease your savings, all right? Your cash flow is gonna go up a little bit, but your savings rate's gonna go down. So at the end of the month, you've, you've now got $69,000 in cash, 138,000 in your 401k, $56,000 in annual cash flow. So let's review in full at the end of four years. You've got property number one, number two, property three, number four, number five, property number six, number seven, number eight, number nine, and you've got that primary residence. So in total, you have 10 properties, 13 doors rented out, $3.7 million in total value. $2.5 million in outstanding mortgages, cash of $76,000, 401k of $140,000, cash flow of $56,000, and you are still saving $10,000 a month from your W-2 or your self-employed position. So let's see, we started January 1st and it took us four years. Let's review where we started and now where we're at. In year one, we were a tenant. Now we are a homeowner and a landlord. We had $100,000 in savings. Now we've got $76,000 in savings. We had $100,000 in our 401k. Now we've got $140,000. We had a job with $100,000 of annual income. We still have a job with $100,000 of annual income, probably higher, assuming we've done a good job. We've gotten raises, promotions. Assuming we didn't really irritate our boss by being out working on our renovation properties all the time, hopefully we haven't gotten fired and we've still got our job. But at the time we started, we had zero properties, zero passive income. Now we have 10 properties and $56,000 of passive income. We have added 50, almost 50 or more than 56% to our annual income. Our net worth was $200,000 when we started. It is now $1.4 million. We have multiplied our net worth by more than seven times. We did it all with a $100,000 salary, a $100,000 savings, and a $100,000 retirement account. How did we do it? Discipline. All right. You have to be disciplined to make this work. The willingness to live with our tenants, that was not fun. Not something I'm gonna do, not something Jared's gonna do, maybe not something that anybody on this call is gonna do, but I'm gonna go out on the limb and say you've got some clients or you might have some clients, family members that are willing to do that, particularly to build wealth. Flexibility. We worked on multiple property types, multiple mortgage types. We did not just say, all right, we're only buying condos. We're only buying single families. We're only buying in Denver. We're only buying here. We're only doing this. We did all sorts of different types of transactions. And my favorite time, you want to know how to get rich in real estate? Buy property and wait 20 years. That's how you get rich quick. So it does not happen overnight, but I can assure you four years will go by really, really quickly. So 
Any final questions, Jared? Anything I missed in the chat box? I think we got everything. No, you have not. And guys, what Joe is telling you here absolutely works. I did this. I moved every year for 10 years when I started in real estate. And needless to say, built up my portfolio to at 1.38 doors. So it works. Yeah, it really does. It really does. It happens really, really rapidly. There's some speed bumps along the road. I'm sure you've got some war stories, Jared. I'm sure it was not all rainbows and unicorns, right? There's some things that happen. There's some things that go wrong. You've got to evict a tenant. You've got to replace a water heater. Things come up, but lots of great opportunities in that. All right. So what can we do to help you? So everything that we looked at today is a real transaction that has closed within the last 12 months. So everything I do are conventional loans, FHA, VA, USDA, jumbo loans, investor cash flow loans, purchases, refis, primary residence, second homes, investment properties, HELOCs, as well as fixed rate second mortgages. Um, what is one of the big reasons why a lot of agents and investors work with us? We have an eight day rush service. So this is the fastest that a mortgage transaction is allowed to close by law. As far as I know, we're one of the only people in Colorado that offer that eight day service. Most mortgage lenders require, you know, 21 days, 30 days, some as much as even 45 days. So this is a great service that we offer to help separate your transaction from other transactions in the market. Um, on an average transaction that you write for a 30 day contract, we'll have that loan closed in 21 days or less. We have our 100% pre-approval record, meaning if we give you a pre-approval, that loan will close. And that is really, really important when you're out looking at properties with your clients. Um, if you're not familiar with HomeBot, we have an outstanding CRM that you can upload your database and then they'll get a monthly um, CMA from you uh, to really help you keep in touch with your clients. Um, we offer our e-flyers to help with your listings and our single property websites. And last and probably most important, all of the classes that we teach in person and online with the support of our great title partners like Jared Patterson over at First Alliance Title. Really enjoy talking with you guys. Really enjoy talking about real estate. If there's anything I can do, please give me a call. All of my information is over here. Of course, follow me on Facebook, tick, uh, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, TikTok, and you can download our mobile mortgage calculator by scanning that QR code right there. So Jared, that is everything I wanted to talk about. Any final thoughts from you? Why should we call you for title? I know, but I want to hear you say it. <laughs> well, let's put it this way. We have five offices around town. We have probably one of the most experienced closing staff in the business. Uh, we have great communicators. We work with investors well. We work with agents well. We help you grow your business. What else do I got, Joe? You know what? I wouldn't be where I'm at without you. <laughs> so, you know, you, you help me a lot and, and you, you do a lot for agents, you do a lot for the investment community and you're a wealth of knowledge, right? There's times that I've called you and said, Jared, I've got this deal and it's weird. Can we, can you walk through it? And, and you've got a breadth of experience and knowledge that anything I run across, if I haven't seen it before, you probably have, or Greg probably has, and you guys are just a great experience and wealth of knowledge to help me and my clients. And I'm really grateful to have you on my team. As, as you also, my friend. All right, everybody out there, everybody. thank you so very much. Uh, if we did miss any of your questions in the chat, we'll follow up with you. Um, thank you guys for joining us. Other questions, comments, call, text, email, we would be happy to chat anytime. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Joe.